The view from a window shows the rooftops of several houses with a long truss bridge spanning a calm river behind them. A barge lazily makes its way through the water. Daylight illuminates sketches of a long high-collared coat hanging just inside the window. On a dresser, a framed photo shows a young, smiling couple. A cup holding makeup brushes sits nearby. The picture topples over. The woman from the photo stands at the dresser hastily packing. She shoves a drawer closed. She tugs dried laundry off a clothesline, then packs the contents of a bedside table's drawer into a cardboard box. She stuffs clothes haphazardly into a suitcase and zips it shut. She glances apprehensively at a cell phone lying on a table beside a thimble, a tailor's measuring tape, and a small pair of scissors. Holding her hands over her mouth and nose, she heaves a breath. She shifts her weight as she considers the phone again. She grabs it. Now she wears a jacket as she stands at a window, the phone to her ear. She grows increasingly distressed as she speaks, pressing a hand over her eyes and forehead. She ends the call looking down at the phone and shaking her head. A bottle of scotch stands on the table nearby, and she whisks it away with her as she passes. She pauses in the apartment doorway, looking inside for a moment, then leaves with the cardboard box under one arm. A table across from the door comes into focus. A key ring with two keys and an engagement ring are resting on it. Now, a lone dark red car drives across the truss bridge with dull murky water beneath it. Later, it curves along a narrow road through a lush forest. The woman grips the steering wheel as she drives. Her short manicured nails are painted a deep red. She blinks back tears. The car winds down a two-lane road past green fields. Bordering the fields, an expanse of trees stretches out to the horizon. At a gas station, the woman picks up the pump and presses a button on a panel. Above it, a row of green arrows lights up momentarily. She looks back at the station's convenience store. Bright neon signs in the windows glow into the night advertising po'boys and slusho. Two more signs indicate open 24 hours. She sees the glare of a truck's approaching headlights as it pulls in behind her car. She tenses, throwing the vehicle sidelong glances. The headlights blink out. She eyes the driver of the truck uneasily, then turns her back to him. Later, she drives again, the lamps lining the road and an oncoming car the only light in the otherwise pitch-black landscape. She looks aside at her phone. The caller ID reads, Ben. Her fingers hover over the screen, then swipe across it. Michelle, please don't hang up. Just talk to me, okay? I can't believe you just said... Michelle remains expressionless. Michelle, come back. Please say something. Her eyes well up with tears. Michelle, talk to me. Look, we had an argument. Couples fight. That is no reason to just leave everything behind. She swallows. Running away isn't going to help any. Michelle, please... She ends the call. She glances uncertainly at the phone, then licks her lips and turns on the radio. For more details on that, elsewhere today, power has still not been restored to many cities on the southern seaboard. In the wake of this afternoon's widespread blackout, there have been some inclement weather in the region. The problem seems linked to what a... Her caller ID shows Ben again. Michelle is thrown around in her seat as the car swerves wildly. She breaks, but the car spins out of control. Paramount Pictures presents The car tumbles upside down. A bad robot production. The vehicle smashes through the guardrail and rolls to a stop in the grass on the other side. Cut to black. 
Cloverfield. Text appears on either side to form the title, 10 Cloverfield Lane. A close-up shows Michelle's face as she lies with her eyes closed. A trickle of blood is dried on her forehead. Her chest heaves. She swallows, then blinks her eyes open, frowning as she raises a hand to her head. The edges of her nail polish are chipped and worn. Lowering her hand, she grimaces. She looks down at her left arm to see an IV line attached to the inside of her elbow. Her eyes follow the tube up to an IV bag suspended from a stand. Her knuckles are scraped and a patch of blood stains her pillow. Sitting up, she dazedly takes in her surroundings. She is on a mattress on the floor, her room's walls made of cinder block. She moves away the blanket on her legs and finds herself in a knee brace, which is shackled to some metal piping along the floor. She tugs at it frantically. In only a tank top and underwear, she gazes around the barren room. Her eyes find a metal door with a series of bars bracing it shut. She sees her clothes and belongings in a small pile on the floor in the diagonal corner. One wall and half of another is painted pale pink. Only one of two lights in sconces on the half-painted wall is on. Its bulb flickers. She rips the IV line out of her arm and clamps a palm over the wound. She strains against the chain on her brace. She tries to pry open a metal cable tie at the bottom of the brace. Another cable tie is fastened around the top. She attempts to pull apart the two metal bars in the brace's hinge, but to no avail. She squeezes her eyes shut as she cries, leaning sideways against the wall. Her eyes dart desperately, then survey the room again. She grabs the IV stand. She removes the IV bag from a hook at the top, then reaches the pole across the room, partially leaning off the mattress and stretching herself along the floor. The stand inches closer to her things. She lunges, toppling her boots over, then tugs at the pile, which falls apart, scattering her belongings on the floor. She pushes the clothes aside and stretches the hook toward her cell. She places it against an edge of the phone and slides it toward herself. She stares at the cracked screen. The clock shows 6.29 p.m. In the top left-hand corner, it reads, No service. Her hand trembles. She kneels on the mattress, holding the phone high above her head. The service remains the same. Michelle's eyes shift from side to side. She huddles back under the blanket and waits, staring at the door. Through a small window-like grating, she sees someone standing outside. A T-shaped bar swings and hits a vertical bar along the door's edge. A hefty male figure steps in front of her, a gun in a holster at his side. He sets a tray of food on the floor. Michelle holds up her hands, trembling. Okay, okay, please. Please. Please don't hurt me. Please. The man picks up the IV stand and replaces the bag on the hook. Just let me go, okay? I won't tell anybody. I promise. Okay, please just let me go. Please. You need fluids. You were in shock. Michelle gulps. 
What are you going to do to me? The middle-aged man stares grimly at her. I'm going to keep you alive. He has a short brown beard and heavy set jowls. He takes the IV stand outside and brings back a pair of crutches. Work on getting handy with these. He sets them down before Michelle and heads toward the door. My boyfriend was expecting me. He turns back. He'll send the cops looking. I'm sorry. But no one is looking for you. He tosses a small tool onto the mattress then leaves. Michelle looks down at it, slack-jawed. She flinches as the door closes. The T-shaped bar shifts toward the vertical bar as it locks into place. Alone again, Michelle gazes down. She picks up the small tool. As she examines it, realization crosses her face. She uses it to unlock the cuff shackling her to the pipe. She slides the cuff's chain from the brace, then slowly pushes herself up into a kneeling position on her good leg. She picks up the crutches and struggles to her feet. She slips into her jeans, carefully balancing her weight on her uninjured left leg and pulling the fabric tight over the bulky brace. She tries to budge the T-shaped bar on the door, then peers out through the grate. She sits back down, glancing from side to side. She picks up one of the crutches and pulls off the rubber tip. She rummages under the blanket for the handcuff key and uses it to whittle away at the narrow end of the crutch. Later, the mattress is littered with shavings as she continues to whittle the wood into a point. She runs a finger over the point. Now, Michelle stands with her back against the wall beside the door, holding the crutch at the ready. She anxiously tightens her grip on the makeshift spear. She grows increasingly tense, her chest heaving. Her shoulders slump and she shifts her gaze from the door. Her head lulls sideways. Her eyes lift and she leans forward. She finds a vent on the wall jutting out above her. Now, standing on the mattress folded in half and propping herself up using the crutch, she flips open the grate over the vent. She rummages through her bag and pulls out a matchbook with two matches left. She wraps a sheet of cloth around the tip of the crutch. Moments later, she cautiously raises the flaming cloth to the vent and pushes it inside. Flames flicker out the vent into her room. A stream of smoke billows out to the ceiling and begins to cloud the upper half of the room. <coughs> Michelle waits beside the door again, aiming the sharpened end of the crutch toward it. She lunges at the man who shoves the crutch away and grabs her. He uncaps a syringe and injects her upper arm. Her legs give out. Later, Michelle's hand lies motionless on the mattress. Her fingers twitch and she jolts awake. She sees the tray of food still on the floor. You've got some fight in you. Michelle sits up. I can respect that. But don't even think about trying that again. The man sits in a chair by the door. You're lucky to be here at all. My generosity only extends so far. Eggs. He brings over a pill cup. Toward all to help with your pain. Please. Please, just let me go, please. There's nowhere to go, Michelle. She gapes up at him. I look through you all. Given as how I saved your life, I think that's acceptable. You're lucky to be here at all. 
What do you mean? I found you, and I saved your life by bringing you here. She shakes her head. I don't understand. I... He brings his chair closer and sits down, facing her. There's been an attack. He looks down at his laced fingers. What? An attack. A big one. I'm not sure yet if it's chemical or nuclear, but down here we're safe. She slouches down against the wall. So where are we exactly? Underneath my farmhouse. Forty miles outside of Lake Charles. She knits her brow. Uh, I was driving north of here. You were in an accident. You were turned over on the side of the road. I was driving by, and I saw... He blinks back tears. I saved your life, Michelle. I couldn't just leave you there. Her gaze wanders thoughtfully. Okay. Well, thank you so much for saving my life. I, he smiles. I guess I should, I should go to a hospital now. The man wearily rubs a hand over his brow. You can't leave. <sighs> An attack means fallout. He rises to his feet. Which contaminates the air above ground. That, that's how it works. Well, how, how long do we have to wait until it's safe? It depends on the proximity to the closest blast. One year, maybe two. Her eyes widen. <sighs> and that's if we're, we're talking about weapons that we know of. Russians are developing some nasty stuff. And if the Martians finally figured out a way to get here... Their weapons will make the Ruskies look like, like, like sticks and stones. He gazes at the ceiling. Luckily, I prepared for this. He lays a hand on the jutting section of wall with the vent, then gives Michelle a proud smile. I need to use your phone then to call my family and, and tell them that I'm safe here and make sure they're okay. Michelle, they're not okay. How do you know that? He closes his eyes for a moment, then shrugs his shoulders. Everyone outside of here is dead. She looks away from his frowning face. But what about you? Don't you have a family? He begins to answer. Who's that? She cranes her neck toward the door. Excuse me. He leaves the room. The door remains open. What did you do? Just outside the door, shelves of piled cans and boxes shake. She straightens as the man returns. He picks up a plastic first aid box off the floor. You know what, Michelle? I'm going to tell you what I told him. You need to eat, you need to sleep, and you need to start showing me a little bit of appreciation. Placing the box on the chair, he picks them up and walks to the door. My name is Howard, by the way. He closes the door. Later, Michelle sleeps on the mattress with the blanket covering her. She wakes up and looks at the ceiling. She props herself on one elbow, her gaze fixed upward. Her eyes glide across the ceiling to the vent, its grate now closed. She notices the door standing ajar. She exits the room into a passageway lined with shelves full of food supplies. She slowly hobbles with a crutch under one arm for support. She startles. Oh, God. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> a bearded, shaggy-haired man sits up from a bed behind some shelves. Sorry about that. Uh, I didn't mean to scare you. Are you, um, um, are you hungry? He offers an open bag of crackers, but she just stares at him. So, um, uh, how are you doing? Uh, you okay? His arm rests in a sling. What is this? It's a bunker. In your room's a little bit of a fixer-upper, but well, at least you got a door. Scary door, but you still got a door. How long have you been down here? A couple of days, I think. 
You know, it's actually kind of hard to tell with uh, no windows, sunlight, or anything. <laughs> I mean, how do we get out of here? His smile fades. He didn't tell you? About... He stares up at her. Getting out of here is the last thing you want to do. Because the air up there is contaminated. I see you've met Emmett. As Howard approaches, she nods. What happened to him? He did that to himself. And his stumbling around isn't helping anything. What you heard earlier was him knocking over a shelf with a whole week's worth of food, which he's sorry for, correct? Emmett looks up at Howard and nods. Totally. His eyes flicker back to Michelle, who shifts her troubled gaze to Howard. Let's go. Bathroom time. She glances at Emmett questioningly. He pops crackers into his mouth and shrugs his brow. Later, she limps barefoot over concrete, then onto carpeting, leaning on her crutch. She looks around a well-furnished living space. This is the common area. Good for R&R. As you can see, I've planned for a long stay. The aquaponics system cleans the air and keeps it fresh. This is the living room. Help yourself to any reading. If you like to watch films, I have some on DVD and VHS cassette. Just make sure you put them back in their sleeve when they're done. The kitchen is fully functional. Has an electric stove, refrigerator, freezer, silverware. And that table is a family heirloom, which means watch your glasses. Always use coasters and placemats. Michelle trips and Emmett grabs her arm. Keep your hands to yourself. Emmett immediately drops his hand away from Michelle. Understand? Emmett nods. No touching. Take a seat. Howard keeps his eyes on Emmett, who sits at the dining table. Howard gestures to the room behind him. This way. His lips are pressed in a tight frown. Michelle hesitates, avoiding his gaze, then limps toward the other room. Howard follows behind her as she takes in the bedroom with wood-paneled walls. This is my private space, off limits, unless I give express permission. She turns to him. Go ahead. He gestures, then looks away. But I don't need to. You will, though. And I've got to pace these things out, so please. I need privacy. You're welcome to close the curtain. A narrow bath and toilet area is separated from the rest of the room by a shower curtain. I can't with you standing there. And I can't trust you not to burn this place down. This is for my own safety. I'm not some pervert. Just go. He rolls his eyes and looks away, resting his head back against the door frame. Her shoulders sag as she considers the bathroom nook. She leans her crutch against the wall beside a handful of survival and wilderness literature. Don't flush unless you've gone. Can't afford wasted flushes. A toilet and sink are set up on opposite ends of a bathtub. Michelle closes the shower curtain, revealing a yellow duck and rain gear on it. Later... Take a seat. Are you hungry? Howard putters around in a tidy, raised kitchen area. Michelle notices a stack of teen magazines. Those are Megan's. She never went anywhere without two or three of those things. Who's Megan? Megan's not with us anymore. Michelle looks up as the lights flicker, then briefly fade off before returning to full power. Don't worry. Just a generator. Maybe it's a car outside. <laughs> That's not possible. I heard one earlier, above my room. If you had heard a car, the driver would be long dead by now. Well, shouldn't we at least try to call the police or someone to find out what actually happened? There's no one left to call. See that? Nothing's coming through. He points to a CB radio. Michelle averts her gaze and Howard leans his hand against the countertop. You think I sound crazy? He touches his head with a wooden spoon. She looks back at him. It's amazing. You people... You wear helmets when you ride your bikes. You have seat belts in your cars. You have alarm systems to protect your homes. But what do you do when those alarms go off? Her face remains blank. Crazy is building your ark after the flood has already come. She gives him a concerned look. He straightens. 
I think maybe it's time you met Frank and Mildred. He gestures to a door beyond the kitchen. Michelle limps toward the short flight of stairs up to the kitchen platform. Now she stands at the bottom of a steep flight of stairs traveling up a tunnel. A welcome mat sits at the top of the steps. Light shines through a small window in a door beyond. Michelle holds onto a railing built into the concrete steps and climbs them slowly. Howard follows behind her, watching. She gets right up to the window and sees another door a short distance from the first. Its window lets sunlight in from outside. Closest I could get to an airlock. Howard undoes a padlock on the first door, then another lock built into the door. As he swings down a latch, Michelle watches his movements. She opens the door and limps into the antechamber, moving quickly to the window. A sugarcane field stands a short distance from the door. To the left of the door, a wire animal pen holds two dead pigs, their flesh mottled and bloody. Michelle clamps a hand to her mouth. See? What happened to them? They weren't as lucky as you. It's the air, Michelle. That's what happens when you get exposed. Her eyes wander over to a pickup truck, its passenger side dented and scratched with streaks of dark red paint on it. In a flashback, Michelle glances at her phone as she drives. She notices a light coming from behind her and sees the same pickup truck in her mirror. I keep this door sealed at all times. Her jaw drops and she stares at the truck. No one comes in or out. Slowly, she glances back at him over her shoulder. He puts the padlock back in place. Later, Michelle sits in her room, leaning against the wall. They're Frank and Mildred, huh? Emmett looks over his shoulder as he comes in. It's funny, right? Whole world ends and the thing he's most upset about is a pair of dead pigs. She doesn't look at him. You in need of some uh, reading material? Took all the quizzes. Sorry. He offers her a couple of teen magazines. Michelle accepts one and he sits down next to her on the mattress, opening the other magazine. But I did learn how to do a French braid, so... You know, if you want me to do that for you, just let me know. She scrutinizes him, unsmiling, then surveys their surroundings. What do you know about him? He glances at her, then at the open door. He was in the Navy. I know that. I guess he did, uh, some stuff with satellites. What kind of stuff? Satellite stuff. Well, what brought him out here? I'm not sure. We bought this property a while back. But I never paid much attention until he hired me to help him get this place set up. She eyes him. The uh, work was entertaining, though, that's for sure. You know, Howard's like a black belt in conspiracy theory. Yeah. Plus, you know, how often you get hired to help build a doomsday bunker. So he didn't... Kidnap you? No. He shakes his head, grinning. What about your arm? Were you trying to escape? I was trying to get in. And I watched Howard build this place piece by piece for years. He was always talking about, you know, possible attacks from Al Qaeda, Russia, South Korea. You mean North Korea? The is that the crazy one? She nods and looks away. So yeah, that one. Um and, uh, you know, poured all his money in his place, took to it like his life depended on it. Which, you know, that stays with you. As Emmett focuses back on his magazine, Michelle watches him. So. She gets to her feet. Told you all this. She flexes her injured leg. While you're building his bomb shelter. And now he says that the air is contaminated and that everybody's dead. He closes his eyes for a moment. Yeah, I, I know what you're getting at, but there's more to it. Howard abducted me. He gives an incredulous look. He drove me off the road, and he dragged me here. So whatever he's telling you about the air, some big attack, the purpose of this shelter is a lie. No, no way. 
He shakes his head. The attack, I saw myself. What do you mean? I was on my way home from work. And it looked like a flash. Bright red. Like an explosion from way far off. It wasn't like fireworks. He shakes his head, his eyes pensive. No, this was more like something you'd read about in the Bible. So what you saw, what, a flash of light? Lightning? A, a fire that flared up? I'm not explaining it right. This wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. And so my first thought was to come here. When I got here, Howard was closing the door. And I could see it right there on his face. He knew something was happening. Something bad. She stares at him, her brow furrowed. And so I fought my way in. She looks toward the door, then back at Emmett. I heard a car. He raises his eyebrows. Right here, above us. His gaze flickers up to the ceiling, then back to her. You heard someone? Right above us. He frowns, then looks up again. That is impossible. The, the air is... What, contaminated? How do you know that? Because I told him. Howard stands at the door, staring at her. Dinner's ready. He turns and walks away. Later, Michelle sits stiffly at the dinner table. Yellow striped wallpaper adorns the bunker's walls behind her. Howard carries two plates of food, setting one before Emmett and the other in front of her. I see you two are getting along. Pausing as he takes off his baseball cap, Emmett shoots Howard a look. Howard sits. He smiles at them. The smile quickly disappears as the corners of his mouth droop. Michelle and Emmett glance at each other uncomfortably. Howard studies them. He unhooks his keys from a clip on his waistband and pops the cap off of a bottle of soda. He pours it into Michelle's glass. She takes a hesitant bite of her spaghetti. How's that sauce? Emmett pours himself soda. Fine. As cooks go, I'm okay. Not great, but okay. Megan was a good cook. You'll learn to love cooking. Under his steady gaze, she gives him a sidelong glance. Emmett closes his eyes and leans his head back. Mm. Mm. Howard stares at him. It's delicious. It's the best sauce I've ever tasted. Are you being funny? No, I mean... Considering the alternative, which is, you know, getting burnt up in a chemical attack or nuclear, I'd say being alive and down here would make a fried turd taste pretty good, so... He holds up his glass. Best damn sauce I ever had. Michelle looks from Emmett to Howard, who stares unimpressed at the younger man. That's not a bad point. And please, watch your language at table. Right? Emmett takes a sip, his gaze on Michelle. You know what I haven't been able to get out of my head for some reason? Ever since I got down here. Tattoos. I always wanted one. But I never got any. Because everybody always said, no, no, Emmett, you never get a decent job if you do that. Whatever. Like that matters now, right? Michelle glances at Howard. Tell you what. If I'd have known this was coming, I would have gotten like 50 of them. I swear, man. I would look like a... Like circus freak or something. I'd just be covered head to toe. Tattoos all over my, you know, everywhere. Face? Sure. Right there. Across my forehead. Just my name. Emmett. Or, you know. Howard eyes Michelle. Thug life. <laughs> YOLO. I don't even know what that means, but, you know, I hear people saying it all the time, so it must be cool. <laughs> Michelle smiles down at her food. Hey, what about you, Howard? Hmm? Anything you wish you'd done? Howard fixes Emmett with a cold stare. In all honesty, no. No? Emmett forks up spaghetti. No crazy nights in Vegas. Maybe uh, take a pilgrimage to wake up. He takes a bite. Everything I wanted to do, I did. I focused on being prepared, and I was. Howard turns to Michelle. And here we are. He sips from his glass of soda. 
Michelle throws an uncomfortable glance at Emmett, who looks aside and spots a pile of board games atop a dresser. Oh my goodness. Is that Monopoly? There we go. Yeah, that's how we kill the time. I mean, what'd you say? Uh, we're gonna be down here, what, like a year, two, maybe? Bet you if we started a game right now, we might even get halfway through the Stop talking! Later. Howard squeezes his eyes shut and alternately balls his fists and flexes his fingers. Michelle regards him warily while Emmett watches with a slight smirk. You don't need to make jokes about how long we're going to be down here. Well, nobody knows how long that's going to be. Your humor is not funny. I don't appreciate it while I'm trying to eat and neither does Michelle. Now please shut up and let us eat in peace. Howard stares down Emmett, who averts his gaze, his jaw shifting. They both continue eating. Michelle shoots Howard furtive sidelong glances and eyes the ring of keys hanging on the clip attached to his belt loop. She forces a faint smile as she turns to Emmett. Hmm. Emmett? He looks over. Can you pass me a napkin? His eyes slide from her to Howard, then back again. He hands her a paper napkin. I know what you're saying. I never could finish Monopoly. The game really does take forever, right? For me, though, it was, um, shoots and ladders. Howard uh, glares at her. Sorry and trouble. You know, the thing was the, the dice and the thing that you press. What was that called? Uh, the problematic pop bubble. bubble yeah. Yeah. Did you ever play that, um, what was it, Operation? Loved Operation. Same, man, I couldn't play that game. Why Terrified me. That noise that thing would make <laughs> when you hit that edge. I mean, good Lord. <laughs> That's pretty scary. Could you hand me the salt? He glances at her with a hesitant smile. Please. He hands her the salt shaker. She sprinkles some over her plate. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I'm going to need the pepper also. She puts her hand on Emmett's for a moment. He stifles a smile, glances at Howard, then passes the pepper. Howard pounds the table. What do you think you're I'm, doing? I'm asking for pepper. Like hell you were. What was that? I don't know what you're talking about, Howard. You're trying to insult me here in the shelter that I built that's keeping you alive? You don't think I see what you just did? Is that how you thank me for saving your life? Howard, calm down. Yes. Shut up! Shut up and stay in your seat! With Howard leaning close to her against the wall, Michelle slowly reaches for his keys as he glowers at Emmett. Is it? Well, let me tell you. He gets in her face. I know what a traitor looks like. Understand? She nods. I have shown you nothing but generosity and hospitality. I want you to apologize. To tell me you're going to behave. She looks at him meekly. Oh, well. He turns away, his keys still clipped, then you, faces her again. You will what? He leans in close. I'll behave. And I'm so sorry. Howard lightly pounds the wall behind her, then turns away. He sits back down, as does Michelle, who clutches the key ring in her fist under the table. All three avoid each other's gazes. Howard drains his glass. He grabs a second bottle of soda. I have to stay hydrated. Michelle keeps her fist tight around all of the keys, her other hand clasped over it. It's easy to forget down here. As she slowly lifts a fork of spaghetti to her mouth, Howard scrutinizes her. What's wrong? Howard narrows his eyes at her as she eats. He reaches for the clip at his waist, which now holds only a pocket knife. Or my keys. As he looks upward, Michelle grabs the empty soda bottle and smashes it on his head. She climbs over the table and dashes away, toppling over a shelf at her back. 
Emmett tries to follow her, but Howard tips over the table in his path and he falls to the floor, wincing. She hobbles up the steps to the airlock. She starts to open the padlocks and the bolts. Howard tosses aside the fallen shelf and follows. He arrives at the foot of the steep staircase. He begins climbing. She moves to the final padlock. Howard reaches the landing just as she goes through the inner door and locks it shut behind herself. She fumbles with the keys to the outer door. Michelle sees a pair of bright headlights through the window. There's a car! There's a car! I see a car! From outside, a blonde woman throws herself against the door. Her skin is mottled red. There's a woman! She Open the door! It's okay. I, I, I just, I, I want to come inside. She looks hurt. She wants me to let her in. Do not let her in. Look at her face, Michelle. No. Michelle no. stares at the woman's splotched no. raw skin and red eye. No. Oh, my God, I'm fine. I really am fine. Please, I, I'm okay. It, it really only, it only got me a little, little, little. Please go open the door. Open it. She's begging you me. You can't help her. No one can. And I'll be okay. I'll be okay. It really hardly touched me at all. She slaps the window. Open the door. Open the door. God, open the door, you bitch. Let me in. Let me in. Michelle slowly backs away from the door. The woman bears her teeth, her eyes wild. You. She bashes her head against the window. You! You! Man. Each blow leaves blood on the glass. Michelle backs away. Later, Michelle sits against a wall in her barren room and stares down. She keeps her eyes lowered as Howard walks in, holding a stack of folded clothes and a light bulb. He goes to the unlit sconce, removes the lampshade, and replaces the bowl. I know it's hard. Realizing they're all gone. Howard wears a bandage on his forehead. The ones you love. He puts the lampshade over the new bulb, which emits a warm glow. He leans back against the wall. I have something to confess to you. I crashed into your car. Your accident was my fault. When I found out about the incoming attack, I got frantic. I knew I needed to get back here as soon as possible, so I was driving like a maniac. I tried to pass you, and... He shrugs. I'm the reason you went off the road. Uh, I mean, I know I seem like a sensible guy, but at the time, I wasn't myself. It was an accident, but it was my fault. I was afraid to tell you, and I'm sorry. Michelle's jaw drops and her eyes flit from side to side. You should shower. Even the smallest amount of air that came through the hinges could be toxic. These are Megan's. He sets down the clothes. If you want. Michelle eyes the t-shirt with an image of the Eiffel Tower. Above it reads Paris Je Tem. I recognize that woman's car. Later. Her name was Leslie, I think. Howard neatly sets a box and towel on the table. You knew her? She was a neighbor. Emmett wasn't the only one who knew about this place. If any others somehow survived, they could be coming here too. He sits down. As of Friday, kindness and generosity are antiquated customs. Michelle hangs her head. Howard takes out a few first aid supplies from the box, including a suture kit. I'm going to need some stitches. 
He peels off the bandage from his forehead to reveal a deep vertical cut. He turns to Michelle and watches her expectantly. She frowns back at him. Why, you want me to? This is your doing, isn't it? I mean, I don't think I'm really qualified. I'll walk you through it. As she gawks, he holds up a finger. Here. He unscrews a jar filled with clear liquid. Have a drink. He pours some out into a metal cup. What is it? Technically, it's vodka. Michelle frowns as she watches him take a sip. It's safe. I distilled it myself. He places it on the table and turns the handle toward her, then watches her out one eye as she tries some. <coughs> I just said I distilled it. I didn't say anything about it. It's actually tasting good. Yeah, that's awful. You want it on the rocks? He sprays white froth onto the cup from an upside-down can of compressed air. little trick I taught myself as a young man stationed on a ship with way too much free time. Every now and again, if the CO was working us too hard, we'd freeze and snap the knob off the bathroom door while he was still inside. Usually took him an hour or two to get out. He returns the can to the table and offers her the chilled cup. I'm good. Suit yourself. Cheers. He drinks more. Oh. He dips a curved needle on a thread into the cup. This is clean. All you need to do is stitch. He hands it to her, then leans back in his chair. She cautiously steps closer and places one hand on his brow above the cut. Stealing herself, she pushes the needle through his skin. He shuts his eyes. You're doing fine. Later, Howard places a cardboard box on the table. From stuff I grabbed from your car. Didn't have time to bring in the booze. Sadly. She retrieves a bound book from inside the box. What is all that? She flips through the pages of clothing sketches. I wanted to design clothes. No wonder you were so good with the stitches. Megan wanted to be an artist. Michelle's expression softens. She was your daughter? Yes. He gives her a quick, forced smile, then goes to his room and brings back a book with a photo in it. She was smart. Loved to read. The magazines were just for fun. She inhaled books. Anything with Paris. She liked their movies, their culture, you know. We used to have this little joke every once in a while. I'd ask her, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know what she'd say? French. He shows her a picture of a pretty, smiling girl. Anyway, her mother turned her against me, took her off to Chicago. People are strange creatures. You can't always convince them that safety is in their own best interest. Michelle shakes her head slightly. You don't know they're gone. He heads back into his room. Anyway, at least I tried to help them. Later, Michelle sits on the floor of her room, leaning against the wall, and flips through the sketchbook. Hey. She turns to the wall. You know, there was nothing you could have done for that woman. Emmett sits on the other side. Even if you let her in, she still would have died. Michelle nods hesitantly, then swallows. You asked earlier about regrets? Yeah, I've got some of those. She is surrounded by warm light while his side of the wall is dim and gray. Welcome to the club. <laughs> I mean, I lived my life in a 40 mile radius, you know, and that was by design. You know, I made sure that happened. I was so fast in high school, I even managed to outrun my bad grades. He gazes off. I was all state track three years in a row. Caught a full ride to Louisiana Tech up there in Ruston. <laughs> I remember I spent the last two weeks of that summer showing off the bus ticket they sent me to anybody to take a look at it. 
And then came the night before I was supposed to leave. He shakes his head. And I just got so worried. About how bad I was going to do up there. All those smart kids. He wears a distant look. So I went out my way to get just piss wasted so bad that I knew there was no chance I was waking up in the morning. So I missed the bus. And I didn't buy a ticket for the next one or the one after that. Well, if you'd gone, you might be dead now. You're lucky me, right? His grin slowly fades. Lucky us. She smiles briefly, then looks up at the ceiling. She clutches her book closer to herself. A few, um, a few years ago, I was at a hardware store. And there was this little girl with her dad. And he was in a hurry, and she wasn't keeping up. So he kept... Yanking on her arm, but really hard, you know, too hard. She stares ahead with somber eyes. I know that feeling. When my dad got that way, my, my brother Colin was always there to take the worst of it for me. And I thought, you know, seeing this little girl, I thought maybe I could do that for her. Emmett's expression grows solemn. But I just kept watching. And they're about to leave, and I, I've done nothing. She clasps the book tightly. And she slips. And it throws him off balance, and he hits her. And I wanted so badly to do something to help her, but I did what I always do when things get hard. I just panicked and ran. She rubs her forehead, <laughs> then wipes away tears. Look, we're here. We're alive. And that means something. It's got to... Michelle lifts her gaze to the ceiling again. Her shoulders heave. Later, Howard punches in a selection on a jukebox. Emmett scrubs down the drain board by the sink and Howard empties puzzle pieces onto a coffee table. Children Howard tries to prop the box lid up, but it falls over. Michelle sits alone on the couch, adding pieces to the puzzle. Now Emmett tries to hammer a piece in place with his fist. Michelle puts a paint bucket in her room with an embroidered cloth over it, then stands a lamp on top. Howard sets a milk crate in a small plant in a corner. At dinner, Emmett tries to cut chicken one-handed. With an amused smile, Michelle cuts up his food for him. Later, Emmett uses magazine cutouts to make a collage on his wall behind the shelves. In the living room, Michelle and Emmett watch a VHS tape titled Cannibal Airlines. Now, the three play a board game. On another day, Howard and Michelle make peanut butter and marshmallow cream sandwiches together. Howard dumps a garbage bag into a chute in the back wall of the storage corridor. He dusts himself off before leaving. Now, Emmett picks up the puzzle box labeled Catfish with the picture of a cat wearing a snorkel in a fishbowl. He shakes it. You've got to be kidding me. What? We're missing pieces here. Michelle is reclined on a love seat. Look at this poor cat. He's been deformed. He's, he's got one eye. About to go snorkeling and everything, too. Emmett glances over at Michelle. What are you doing? She hands him her magazine where she has drawn survival gear over a beachwear model. Ooh. Corner in the market on post-apocalyptic fashion, huh? Mm-hmm. Need more axes and chainsaws. What? She has a shotgun. Yeah, what if up there it's like... He widens his eyes. What? Lumberjacks? Zombies. She smiles. 
Though even Howard doesn't think that one's plausible. But you should hear his theory about mutant space worms. The room shakes. Emmett and Michelle get to their feet. What is that? Howard? Stay calm. We're okay. Howard studies the ceiling, turning to examine the different sections. What was that? Quiet. That sounds like helicopters. Could be military, but not ours. How can you tell? 14 years in the Navy. What's happening up there? My guess, those flashes that kicked us all off, that was phase one. Take out your opponent's population centers with big hits all at once, fast, and then for round two, ground sweeps. The satellite log showed an increase in coded traffic recently, possibly extraterrestrial signals. And I bet what we just heard were airborne patrols sent to hunt down the remaining signs of life. Like us. An LED light on the wall starts flashing. Okay. Oh, boy. That's bad. A little later, Howard pulls at a hatch in the storage corridor ceiling. And that's worse. He uses both hands to no avail. What's up there? Air filtration system. I can't... Something blocking the hatch. Howard grimaces as he looks at it. If we can't get it back on, we're going to run out of breathable air fast. Emmett and Michelle watch him as he looks at the ventilation duct along the ceiling. In the living room, he opens a vent's grate. You're the only one small enough to reach it. Reach what? The filtration system through there, the main duct. Someone needs to get in there and restart it. Michelle stares open-mouthed, and Emmett glances at her. Give me a hand. Let me go. She's not going to know her way around the unit. You won't fit. Plus your arm. She'll be fine. They move the dinner table. Now, to restart the unit, you just swing the handle off, then on, off, then on. He mouths to himself. That should do it. Her eyes flit up to the small vent. And neither of us will be able to go in and help you if you get stuck. He clicks a flashlight on and off, then gives her a grave look. Don't get stuck. She takes the light from him and gazes back up at the opening. Now, Michelle crawls into the dark air duct. She clicks on the flashlight and the beam bounces over the metal walls. On her stomach, she wriggles through the duct. Keeping her arms tucked at her sides, she uses her elbows and bare feet to help scoot herself forward. Michelle! Everything okay up there? Howard talks to her through a vent. It looks like a dead end. That's the incline. Climb up that and you're almost there. She shines the light ahead. Oh, this sucks. With her feet sliding on the duct's smooth metal, she struggles up into a vertical section. She pushes open a grate. Crawling out, she puts her hand on an envelope addressed to Howard at 10 Cloverfield Lane. The return address reads, Bold Futura, care of Tagruato Company. Standing, she finds the unit and pulls a lever down, then up. She does it again, then flips a switch in a control box below it. The light in the room flickers off briefly. She straightens with a relieved look. Michelle takes in her surroundings and sees shelves of tools and other supplies. She spots a ladder leaning against one shelf and walks over. She looks up the ladder and finds it leading through a circular passageway to a hatch on the roof. Light shines through a small window on the hatch. Michelle climbs up and peers out to see a blue sky with wisps of clouds. She examines the hatch and notes a padlock keeping it shut. Looking closer at the window, she notices a vertical line made from a series of scratches in the glass on the left side. 
she discovers a metal shutter over part of the window and slides it aside to reveal the word HELP scratched into the glass, its letters backwards from her side of the window. Part of the L and P are smeared with blood and another bloody splotch sits below the P. She lifts trembling fingers to the glass, her eyes fixed on the word. Shaking, she retreats down the ladder. Her bare toes curl slightly around the metal rungs until they reach the floor, where one steps on a small metal object at the base of the ladder. She picks up the object and stares at it. Her jaw drops. A little later, she stands in the living room with Emmett. What's wrong? He lied. He lied about Megan. What do you mean? It's a big horror. No. His family moved to Chicago years ago. She holds out the object from the filtration room. What was this? He touches the earring shaped like two raindrops in her palm. Was that blood? She gazes past him. Here, come with me. In Howard's room, she pulls out the book with a photo in it and shows Emmett. The girl in the picture is wearing an identical earring. Wait, that that's not Megan. She stares at him. Why, what do you mean? Yeah, her name is Brittany. I, I remember her. She went to high school with my little sister. She. He shakes his head slightly. She went missing two years back. It was on the news and everything. Most people just thought she skipped town. There was a message up there. It said help. It was scratched on the inside of the window. And this earring... She holds it against the picture. This earring was with it. Did she ever show back up after she went missing? He looks at her, his lips parted. He said to me, he said to my face, that this was his daughter. He said this was Megan. As she grabs the picture and stuffs it back into the book, another photo falls out. Emmett picks it up. Together, they look at a faded snapshot of a smiling Howard sitting on his couch with an arm around Brittany, who stares sullenly. Emmett looks at the girl's t-shirt, which reads, Paris Je t'aime, then eyes Michelle's t-shirt. They're the same. He meets her gaze. He took her and he killed her. Howard closes the trash chute, then strolls past the living room where Emmett and Michelle stand at the jukebox. All right, let's just think. Maybe we take away his gun, tie him up, get him to confess to whatever it is he's done. What, confess to who? The police? Look, like I said, we can't be the only survivors, right? The woman, uh, she was able to get around, right? At least a little. Yeah, until she died. Directly above us, making choking noises of all the people to save us. Now that was a great example of teamwork. Very well done. Feel like some music. He punches the selection into the jukebox. Problem solving always puts me in a musical mood. Bent over the jukebox, he bounces his head and rear to the beat. Michelle, you should go shower just in case. He dances away and she nods. Sure. He mouths the lyrics as he dances to the kitchen. Emmett stares at her, the two of them standing motionless on either side of the jukebox. Now, Michelle reaches into the bathroom unit, past the shower curtain, and turns on the water. Her eyes are drawn to the duck and the raincoat on the curtain. Her eyes widen, then flicker over the curtain. Now, she finds Emmett in the storage corridor as he sits on his cot. I think I might have an idea. She holds out an open magazine. He moves to the edge of his cot and takes it. Ten better ways to style my bangs? No, not the article. This. She points. I think I can only make one. But it's a start. No kidding. Later on Howard's TV. What are you drawing up? I didn't wake you up yet. Oh, it's your breakfast. One egg over medium and I... Hey, Howard. Emmett walks in and adjusts his baseball cap. What is this? Are you watching 16 Candles? Pretty in pink. It was one of Megan's favorite movies. Can I help you with something? No. No, I'm just grabbing some water. <clears throat> Emmett walks towards the kitchen, glancing over his shoulder and fiddling with his hat. 
He looks back at Howard before getting a glass out of a cabinet. He puts the glass in the sink and turns on the faucet, then carefully opens a drawer and takes out scissors. He slips the scissors into his sling, then closes the drawer and turns off the tap. Say, um, you know, I was just thinking. <clears throat> Howard presses a button on the remote. Not that I'm trying to tell you how to run this place or anything. I'm just a little curious. Howard keeps his back to Emmett. Uh, Michelle, say, how close do you think she got to that air filtration unit? You think she touched it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure she touched it. Emmett nods. Well, I know she cleaned up after and everything, but I'm just thinking. Given that unit filters God knows what through from outside, if she tracked anything back in with her, it'd be pretty concentrated. And, I mean, it could be all over the shower and the sink, your bathroom right now. Howard frowns. Anyway, it's just a thought. Emmett leaves. Howard turns the movie back on, then off again. He sets down the remote and rubs his mouth contemplatively. Wearing gloves, Howard strips the shower curtain off its rod. He stuffs it down the garbage chute, followed by the gloves. Later, Michelle and Emmett open up the chute, and Michelle lowers the hooked end of the IV pole to fish out the discarded shower curtain. The magazine lies open to a page with Michelle's doodles of a gas mask and hazmat suit over a model. In her room, she sketches in her notebook referring to the image. Later, she goes through the drawers of a wooden chest in Howard's room. She grabs the suture kit and takes out the needle before replacing the box. She pulls out the book Surviving Doomsday and flips through the pages before ripping one out. In her room, she holds up the sheet which reads Make Your Own Gas Mask as she draws. Emmett opens up drawers at a work table and finds a box cutter. Michelle uses it to cut through the shower curtain, as well as strips of duct tape. Now, Emmett uses the scissors to cut the bottom off a plastic bottle. Later, the two stand over the beginnings of a jumpsuit pattern laid out on Michelle's floor. Not bad so far, partner. If Howard finds this, he's going to kill us. He adjusts his hat. All right, so we get the gun away from him. Right, we tie him up, make sure he isn't going anywhere. And then one of us just goes out and looks for help. She nods and they look away from each other. In the living room, Emmett sets a timer on the coffee table. Michelle sits beside him. Um, he looks at a card in his hand. First word. He closes his eyes. Uh, tiny. Uh, I'm a small pygmy. Um, little. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, second word. Ooh, uh, Michelle is a. Uh, 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 girl. Uh, 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 girl, a child. Her um, brow creases. Uh, he grimaces. Oh, uh, she's a girl. Um, no, she's, she's older, see? So she is a... Uh, 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 he gestures with both hands. Little princess? Howard raises his eyebrows and squints. Emmett averts his gaze while Michelle frowns at the older man. Um, no, it was... woman. Um, little woman. Emmett and Michelle exchange a glance. Wow, little woman. Oh. Howard raises his eyebrows. <laughs> Next time, try being a little more specific. He brings the timer closer and picks up a card from a box. He looks at it, then at Emmett, his tongue sticking out between his lips. Howard bites his lower lip with his eyes averted. He looks up. I'm always watching. Always. His eyes flicker to Michelle and she turns to look at him. He returns his stare to Emmett. Um, God. I'd go wherever I want. Emmett furrows his brow. I, I'm, I mean, uh, I don't know. 
I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. Michelle's eyes widen. Emmett glances at her. Um, I know what you're up to. Look, Howard, uh, I, I don't know what, what you're getting at. I but, see you when you're uh, sleeping. You're at, but I, I don't know, know what you're, what you're doing. Oh, and I'm always watching. Michelle's always eyes shift watching. thoughtfully. I'm always watching. Santa Claus. Her features lighten and she smiles. <laughs> There's Santa Claus. Emmett stares at her open mouth. Yeah, Michelle, that's great. <laughs> Except it was Emmett's turn. Sorry, I just got a little excited. Yeah, well, I'm keeping that point. Totally, you earned it. She glances at Emmett, who twitches a nervous smile. Howard glances between Emmett and Michelle. Later, Michelle kneels in her room using duct tape to put the pieces of her hazmat suit pattern together. She freezes. Emmett? She quickly puts away her sketchbook, sweeps all the supplies under the mattress, and settles down with the magazine. She casually looks up at Howard as he enters. Hey. I need your help with something. She keeps her face impassive. Sure. As they walk into the living room, Howard looks up at Emmett, who stands in the kitchen. You. On deck. Emmett closes a cabinet and joins them. Howard taps his fingers on the top of the kitchen counter. He opens a cupboard beneath it, which holds a large blue plastic barrel. What is this? The barrel. What's in it? Move it into the bathroom. Emmett and Michelle watch him warily, then share a look. Later, they lug the barrel into the middle of Howard's room. This is perchloric acid. He slips on a pair of rubber gloves. Do either of you know what that is? They shake their heads. It's usually produced as a precursor to ammonium perchlorate fuel. Used for launching naval satellites into orbit. He undoes clasps on the barrel. Oh, it's highly corrosive. He lifts up the lid. Dissolves most biological material on contact with humans right down to the bone. Emmett and Michelle stiffen. Hey, Howard. Uh, what are you showing this to us for? Howard fixes Emmett with a stare. You think I'm an idiot. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Howard, please, you're going to have to tell us what it is that you're talking about. I'm talking about getting rid of some waste. He turns away. Emmett and Michelle share an alarmed glance. Tell me what you two are doing with this. He holds up the box cutter, scissors, and tape. They gape at him. You tell me what you two are planning Howard, right now. Listen, just take it easy. Take it easy. Come Howard, on. No. Howard, come on. Please, I'm Howard. I'm giving you one chance. He drops the items into the liquid, which bubbles. Hey. Howard, just calm down. One chance! To answer with some dignity, or I swear to God, you're going into this barrel while you're alive to feel it. It was me. Howard glowers at him. All right, not her. It's just me. No, no, no. She, we, stay we, out of this, all right? She doesn't have a clue what you're talking about. I wanted your gun. And so I was thinking about making a weapon to get it from you. Michelle averts her eyes sorrowfully while Howard continues glaring. Emmett turns to Michelle. I want her to respect me the way that she respects you. Michelle glances uneasily between them. I'm not saying that I was right, okay? And I'm sorry. Howard blinks back at him, his face calm. You're sorry? I'm sorry. Emmett holds his gaze. I accept your apology. He shoots Emmett in the head. Michelle cowers back into a corner, her face contorted with horror. Howard goes over and holds her close as she struggles against him. You heard him. You heard him. He was making a weapon. He was going to hurt us. He was going to hurt you. It's okay. 
This was the way it was always supposed to be. You're safe. Now it's just you and me. It's okay. Yeah, you should go to your room now. This next part is something you need to see. He guides her out of his room. The edge of a wall is splattered with blood. Bright sunlight shines through the window in the door above the steep staircase. The lights in the living room cast a warm glow over the cozy furniture. Fish float lazily in a tank set in a wall nook. The sconces and lamp illuminate the walls of Michelle's vacant room. In the storage room, Michelle sits in Emmett's space, her eyes shining with tears. She stares ahead blankly, then unfolds Emmett's wallet. She gazes at his driver's license. In the photo, he is clean-shaven, but with the same mop of shaggy brown hair. She fingers the edges of the wallet. Michelle? Hey. She wipes her cheeks. I thought we'd change things up tonight and have dessert before dinner. After all, we can do whatever we want now. He holds a bowl and a cone of ice cream. She eyes him incredulously. Would you like a cone or a bowl? Howard's face is cleanly shaven, his hair neatly combed. Megan always wanted hers in the bowl, so the cones were too messy. I know that this isn't the life you prefer, that it isn't easy for you living down here, but I want us to be a happy family, you and me. She averts her dismayed eyes. The mess is all taken care of. So just hang loose and I'll go get dinner started. He swipes his mouth over the ice cream cone and walks away. She watches him leave, then pulls out a creased piece of paper from Emmett's wallet. Fresh tears well up in Michelle's eyes and she swallows as she looks down at Emmett's old bus ticket to Ruston, its edges worn away. She folds it and stares at the floor. She lifts her gaze, her eyes now determined. Back in her room, she finishes taping the suit. A pair of rubber gloves are laid out with it, as well as a makeshift gas mask made from the plastic bottle. Michelle? She sweeps the suit and gloves under the mattress, then picks up the mask. She turns to the air vent. When Howard arrives, she is crouched before the lamp, turning it on. She straightens, watching him enter. Everything all right? Yeah, I was just about to do some reading. She takes a magazine over to the mattress and sits down. It's time to set the table. Supper's ready. She nods. Yeah. Okay. He turns to leave. A screw falls from the vent's grate. Michelle eyes it, then uneasily raises her eyes to Howard. He peers up at the vent. Keeps doing that. I don't, I don't know why. He opens the grate and clasps the vent's lower edge with both hands, feeling inside it. The mask is just beyond his reach and out of view. He shuts the grate. Michelle, why is this loose? He turns around and spots a bit of red plastic peeking out from beneath the mattress. Get up. Why? Get off the mattress. <laughs> he drags her away by her hair and flips the mattress. <laughs> oh, shit! Michelle runs out, slams the door shut, and bolts it. She topples several buckets in front of the door, then runs into the living room. She looks around and barges into Howard's room where she sees Emmett's dissolving form in a chest of fizzing acid. She hurries past it and looks through a few drawers until she finds a can of compressed air. You gonna walk out on me? She whips around to see him standing in the doorway. After I saved you and kept you safe, this is how you repay me. No. This is... 
She kicks the barrel of acid toward him and he falls over in the yellow liquid. She steps from his bed to a dresser, then swings herself out of the room and onto the living room carpet. The acid spreads into the living room, but stops at the metal lip separating the carpet from the hardwood floor. It pulls around a lamp's power cord, starts to emit smoke, then shoots sparks and catches on fire. Back in her room, Michelle bundles the spray can, mask, and gloves in the suit and ties the whole package with a plastic strap. In the corridor, she finds herself facing Howard, a side of his face eaten away and bleeding. His clothes are partially corroded, exposing raw flesh. He charges. She tips over a couple of shelving units, which crash down on him, burying him underneath. Michelle clambers above the heap and flees to the living room. A wall of fire blocks the kitchen exit. She pulls the dining table under the living room vent. She climbs atop it, opens the grate, ties the hazmat bundle to her ankle, then lifts herself up into the vent. Meanwhile, Howard struggles to move the shelves. The orange flames are reflected against the metal interior of the duct as Michelle scoots through the narrow space. <laughs> She pauses to peer through a grate above the corridor and sees no sign of Howard. She continues on. A knife blade juts up through the duct in front of her, then retracts. She waits, frozen. She hurries forward, dragging the bundle behind her. The blade jabs close to her face. She sees Howard directly below her, his fingers grappling with a grate. <laughs> she rushes ahead. Howard pries the grate open and grabs her ankle. No! You don't know what's out there! You can't run from them! Stay with me! She kicks his hand against the edge of the vent, forcing him to release her. Now she crawls out into the filtration room, surrounded by a blooming cloud of smoke. She pulls the bundle through behind her and unties it frantically, letting the items inside fall to the floor. She pulls on the plastic jacket and pants, then tapes down the jacket's hem around her waist. A warning label on the side of the filtration unit reads, Caution, Flammable Explosive. Dark gray smoke seeps up the passageway with the ladder. Michelle slips on the gas mask. She tilts her face up toward the rectangle of light and begins climbing up the ladder. At the top, she sprays the upside-down can of compressed air at the padlock holding the hatch shut. She bangs the can against it, but nothing happens. She bangs it again, then sprays it some more. She clenches her teeth as she hacks away at the lock. It breaks away. She pushes up against the hatch. It opens and bright sunlight floods in. <laughs> she clambers out onto dry earth, then turns back to the hatch, watching it fall shut. Michelle gets to her feet and walks to the area by the bunker's entrance. Tufts of dry grass and a line of green trees stand behind her. Ahead lies the field of tall sugarcane crops. A wider view shows the bunker's shed-like entrance in the middle of a field. She gazes around, frowning, then notices Howard's truck. She strides toward it, then breaks into a jog. She goes to the passenger side door. Opening it, she gazes around. She starts to climb in. A leg of her suit is caught on the door's frame. She finds a tear. 
She falls back on the ground, grabs a roll of duct tape from her belt, and winds several layers of tape around her leg. Her breath fogs up the insides of the mask. She closes her eyes, calming herself. She opens them again with a thoughtful look. She glances around, then nods slightly. She lifts her gaze to the sky and sees a flock of birds flying in a V formation. She stands, staring up at the passing flock, her hand raised to shield the fading sunlight. Slowly, she lowers her gaze from the birds, her brow furrowed. She pulls off her gas mask. Strands of hair stick to the side of her face as she looks around, waiting. She breaks into a grin, but it quickly fades to a disbelieving expression. Her eyes well up and a single tear rolls down her cheek. She lets the mask drop to the ground, her jaw hanging. She whips her head around toward the sugarcane field, then climbs onto the hood of the truck. Getting onto the cab's roof, she looks out beyond the field to see an oblong shape flying across the horizon. Staring, she knits her brow. She glances at the bunker's entrance, then climbs back down onto the hood and hunches against the truck's windshield. A bright light flashes behind the window in the bunker's door. A fireball erupts through the nearby hatch in the ground. Black smoke billows up. Michelle stares wide-eyed, then climbs back onto the roof of the truck. The oblong shape now flies directly toward the bunker site. As it nears, several jagged wing-like protrusions come into view on each of its sides. Two long tendrils extend downward from its sides, and one drops a small dark shape to the ground. The flying object then turns and glides away, revealing a segmented underbelly. Come on. She jumps off the truck and gets into the cab. She checks the glove compartment and the sun visors, then catches a glimpse of the blonde woman's car in the rear view. She looks over her shoulder at it, then runs toward it. She tugs the door handle. Its headlights start flashing. Michelle glances around and sprints away from the car heading away from the sugarcane field. She arrives at a chicken coop, enters and bolts it shut from the inside. Turning to lean back against the doors, she notices the blonde woman's corpse lying slumped in a corner. She peers outside through wooden slats. The car's blazing headlights periodically obscure her field of vision of the now dark landscape. Through the light, she sees a few stalks of sugar cane swaying. Her gaze searches around the car but finds nothing. The rear of the car lifts then crashes down. Backing away from the window, Michelle falls to a seated position. She pushes herself up and looks through the gaps between the wooden slats. The flashing headlights give a glimpse of a creature leaning out from behind the car. Michelle turns and eyes the blonde woman's dead body. She hurries over. 
She pats the body down, her movements frenzied with fear. She turns sharply at the sound and looks up at the roof. The creature's shadow passes over the gap between the planks as it walks over the top of the coop. She follows it with her gaze. She moves the woman's jacket and digs into its pockets. As the creature pokes its head through a small swinging door behind her, she finds the keys. She clicks the remote. The creature turns to the sound, its face comprised solely of a sharp-toothed, dilating mouth. It runs off. Michelle hurries to her feet to peer out the front of the chicken coop, then quickly moves to the swinging door and crawls out. She runs to a wooden pen and ducks behind it, keeping it between herself and the alien creature. She sees a farmhouse in the near distance and starts running toward it, her arms pumping. The creature notices her and gives chase. Help! I'm out here! Help! As she stops at the house, the creature darts off. She glances back for it, but the field is vacant. Some debris burns in the grass. She turns back to the house. The alien spaceship appears over the house, its brilliant beams shining through the windows. Michelle backs away, wide-eyed. A gas spray from the ship starts up behind the house. Michelle turns and runs back across the field with the ship following her. She skids to a stop by the truck and yanks her discarded gas mask back on, looping duct tape around her to seal the open end to her suit. The alien ship moves slowly overhead, and streams of gas spread over the grass toward her. Michelle closes her eyes as the gas washes over her. She watches gas billow over the hatch. Flames explode from it. She gets to her feet and sees the scaled alien creature a short distance away. It gallops toward her. As she jumps into the truck, the creature grabs the door. She struggles to pull it shut, and the alien extends its telescopic mouth towards her. She immediately closes the door. <laughs> Tendrils from the alien ship extend down in front of the truck. They wrap around the vehicle and pull it up, throwing Michelle to the back of the cab. She struggles upright to see the underbelly of the ship a section of which opens to reveal a mouth-like orifice in the middle. She leans back defeatedly, lolling her head in exhaustion, Michelle notices a lighter wedged in the seat. She picks it up. She lights it, her eyes flickering thoughtfully. On the floor, the bottle of scotch from her apartment rolls into view. She scrambles for it. She finds a road map and rips out a few pages, then stuffs them into the neck of the liquor bottle. She climbs into the front seat and rolls down the window. Michelle leans halfway out of the truck and uses the lighter to set the paper on fire. Three flaps in the orifice open and close like a valve as the truck draws closer. Michelle throws the makeshift Molotov cocktail into the opening right before the flaps close. The valve explodes in a burst of fire and the truck plummets to the ground. <coughs> Cut to black. Seen through the truck's windows, smoke trails from the flaming alien ship as it crashes into the cane field. Michelle lifts her face from an airbag. She slowly straightens and looks to the cane field where flames and smoke plume into the air from the crash site in the distance. Michelle gets out of the wrecked truck and leans against it. She turns to the dead woman's sedan and finds it undamaged. 
She gets in and turns the key in the ignition. She turns the car and drives up a dirt road between the cane fields. A hazy film of smoke hovers over the farm. Michelle takes a sharp turn off the dirt onto the main road, smashing through a mailbox on the way. The address printed on the toppled box reads, 10 Cloverfield. Later, the car's headlights glow on the otherwise dark, deserted road as Michelle drives past lush green farmland. Michelle glances at the radio, then pulls off the gloves still taped to her suit and adjusts the tuning. The military has taken back the southern seaboard. You are hearing this and aren't in a safe zone. Head north of Baton Rouge. But if you have any medical training or combat experience, we need help. There are people in Houston. She slams the brakes. There are survivors at Mercy Hospital. Help. She puts the car in reverse to read a sign. It shows an arrow pointing straight for Baton Rouge and one pointing left for Houston. We need our help. Come join us. We've taken back the southern seaboard, and we're winning. She stares at the sign, her eyes becoming determined. She puts the car in gear, drives forward, and takes the left turn onto another road. City lights shine on the distant horizon. Flashes light the dark sky, the silhouettes of more alien ships briefly visible behind the clouds.